So we've just have read that uh, the moral law is permanently normative. It forever, it does forever bind all, whether you're justified or not. Uh, so as well justified person, justification does not free us from the obligation to keep the moral law. Um, though we're certainly not saved by the keeping of the law. But it is also not a law just for believers. It is not, and, and others, as well justified persons as others. It's a, it's a universal obligation. In fact, I was just reading of, well, the other morning was at Isaiah 26, 27, 28, where the nations are being judged on the basis of their obedience or lack thereof to the commands of God. So it's not as though, well, we're not a Christian nation, we're just nation nation. Well, nations are all obligated to keep the, God's laws. So uh, in the further explanation, uh, although true believers are not under the law as a covenant of works to be thereby justified or condemned. So th that's crucial, right? We're not saying that by law keeping, we're going to be justified or by failure to keep the law, we're going to be condemned. Yet it is of great use. So the usefulness of the moral law is being commended to us, to them as well to, as to others, in that as a rule of life informing them of the will of God and their duty, it directs and binds them to walk accordingly, discovering also the sinful pollutions of their nature, hearts, and lives, so as examining themselves thereby, they may come to further conviction of humiliation for and hatred against sin, together with a clearer sight of the need they have of Christ and the perfection of his obedience. It is likewise of use to the regenerate to restrain their corruptions and that it forbids sins and the threatenings of it serve to show even uh, uh, what even their sins deserve and what afflictions in this life they may expect for them. And, and no, notice that the confession doesn't, doesn't hesitate to refer to these as threatenings even though we're believers, even though we're not justified by law keeping, even though we're not condemned in the failure uh, to keep the law in, in any kind of eternal sense, nevertheless, there are temporal consequences which the law threatens. You get drunk, you may drive your car into the tree and break your neck, and you are not exempt from that consequence. So it does, it does threaten us with um, afflictions of threatening uh, of it serve to show even what even their sins deserve and what afflictions in this life they may expect for them, although freed from the curse thereof threatened in the law. So be beautifully balanced. Uh, no, no, you're not exempt from the, the temporal consequences of your sin. You, you can't expect you're going to be spared those. You may be, but you can't expect that to be the case. So there are these, uh, there are consequences in this world when we defy God's law, um, you know, to put a formula on it, you don't break God's laws, God's laws break you. And that's true for everyone. Whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, you break God's laws, they will break you. You commit adultery, you will pay. Uh, you murder someone, you um, steal, it's, it's going to catch up with you. If not in this world, then it, it is certainly in the next. Uh, okay, you may expect for them, though freed from the curse thereof, threatened in the law. The promises of it in like manner show them God's approbation of obedience and what blessings they may expect upon the performance thereof, although, although not as due to them by law as a covenant of works, so as a man's doing good and refraining from evil because the law encourageth to one and deterreth from the other is no evidence of his being under the law and not under grace. Are there blessings that come from obedience that are related to obedience? Yes. That, yeah, blessings that come from obedience, blessings that are forfeited by disobedience. Is that not the case? So the confession is saying yes. Uh, does that mean that, uh, that uh, justification is, uh, is based on that? No, not at all. This is not a, 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 um, evidence of being under the law and not under grace. Uh, so maybe the most uh, basic 
reason God gave the law to his people was simply because that's what he wanted them to do. This is, what, this is the way I want you to live. That's, that's why he gave the law. Of course. By definition. Yeah. It, it is still strange to me that that is considered the third use of the law. Well, Calvin calls it the first and primary use. Um, it's a, the obvious one. Yeah, it is the first and primary use, but in terms of, I think, historical theology and our understanding of its function, the insight into the third use was not well developed until, um, you know, the first one, it's in your notes, Melanchthon in his, um, what did they call that work of Melanchthon? Anyway. He, he, he first, and then, it, th and then the next place it shows up is in Calvin's first edition of the Institutes. And I think it's 1537. But it goes, uh, um, uh, loci, anyway, the loci communes, something to that effect. Anyway, Melanchthon to Calvin, and then it's part of the whole Reformed tradition. And it, it's in the Lutheran's Book of Concord. The third use of the law, because you know, there's this, there is a difference between the Lutherans and the Reformed about the third use, and the and the Lutherans have tended not to follow Melanchthon and the, uh, the Book of Concord, uh, and have um, have resisted the third use and, and 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 accused the Reformed of overplaying it. But it's actually in their confessional documents. Um, so we have made more of that third use than they have, certainly. And you can look at the larger catechism, the shorter catechism, nearly a third of each of those is, is taken up with the exposition of the law of God, the Ten Commandments. Yes? Could you just speak briefly on how that <coughs> law intersects or, or goes in hand with providence? You said you, you drink, you drive, you get into a crash, you get injured. But you know, how does that, how does, how does providence intersect with that? Well, I, I, if I understand your question, I think that ultimately providence is just what we, what, when we describe, when we're describing natural temporal consequences, we're talking about how God ordinarily governs the world. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you violate his commandments, he so governs the world that there will be a price that is paid. And so providentially, it's almost uh, virtually inevitable that, uh, that there will be, you will, you will end up with a DUI, you will, you will end up in a car accident. So I'm not, I'm not answering, well, you're, you're still looking puzzled. Yeah, or based in providence, wouldn't that have already been in the cards for that particular person, maybe a different circumstance, maybe a bicycle accident or something like that. But, you know, that, that just seems like a very significant consequence that some would pay and others wouldn't pay by breaking the Lord's laws and, you know, drinking and driving. Or something. So this is a complaint of Psalm 73, is the wicked, they die fat and happy. They die in their beds. Stalin died in his bed. You know, how many tens of millions of people die because of Stalin? He dies in his bed. How, where's the justice in the world? Well, I mean, some matters of justice await eternity. Uh, but in the normal, the normal functioning of life in this planet, God's laws will break you. Sometimes you will suffer the consequences. Sometimes in his grace, he does not dispense the consequence in its traditional form. Like the individual who does drive drunk but never receives a DUI only to later find regeneration and realize that they were only able to do that because of something that God did to them or in them. Or, and as a result of common grace, too, yeah. that people don't get the consequence and others do. Or sometimes it's common grace that they do get it. So that the guy that got the DUI, that sobered him up. So the guy who didn't get the DUI just continued the, uh, the, the abuse of alcohol uh, he got cirrhosis of the liver, and he died when he was 52. Uh, and, and, the, and the guy that got the DUI when he was 29, he, he, uh, he sobered up. He learned his lesson. <coughs> he repented. Uh, he, he determined never to get drunk again. 
So, you know, it's, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but um, that's all in the, in the providence of God, it's in the goodness of God, it's in the judgment of God, and those things are not I equally distributed to all people in all ways, at all times, in all places. But ultimately, justice will be done, and there are consequences, typically in this world, but not always. Uh, but, <laughs> thank you for that. Dan, not in purgatory. Well, just, just because I've heard so many times that that's where you pay the temporal consequences for your sin yeah. that were not done. <coughs> that, that's the, the state of rationale behind it. So, so if you're wrong, but not it would be better to hit the tree and break your neck and then you spend less time in purgatory. You will have already paid. You will already have paid some of the debt that you owe. All right. You all will not be good Catholics. Um, neither are the aforementioned uses of the law contrary to the grace of the gospel. Here's one, another one of those beautiful expressions. But do sweetly comply with it, the spirit of Christ subduing and enabling the will of man to do that freely and cheerfully, which is the will of God revealed in the law require, requireth to be done. So back to, back to the answer to question number three. So you have in the moral law, um, traditionally, we have divided up the moral law into these three categories, the civil use. So the, 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 the moral law does inform the civil government. <coughs> what, should, what should be punished by the civil government? Murder, um, theft, uh, uh, you know, perjury, to give three examples. And in a more Christian society, adultery. Um, Pedagogic use, uh, Romans 3.20, through the law comes the knowledge of the sin. Romans 7.7, the Apostle Paul says, I would not have known sin if the law had not said, thou shalt not covet. Uh, Galatians 3.23, the Apostle Paul refers to the tutorial or pedagogic use of uh, the, the law as a tutor that leads us to Christ, an instructor that shows us our sin and our need of Christ. So that the larger catechism, filling out what we have in the confession, the moral laws of use to unregenerate men to awaken their consciences to flee from the wrath of God to come and to drive them to Christ. So when, you know, like we use it in the second use here. Uh, we use it every Sunday night. So that I'm to reflect, you know, do I have other gods? Uh, do I have idols in my heart? Do I take the Lord's name in vain? Do I desecrate the Sabbath day? Do I dishonor father and mother and other authorities? Do I have murderous anger or adulterous lust in my heart? Have I taken what belongs to other or deprived them of the value of what's theirs? Uh, have I violated the truth? Have I lied? Have I misrepresented? And then internalizing the whole, do I covet what belongs to others? Paul says, you know what, I did, I did all the law. I was blameless. That's what he says in Philippians 3. I was blameless as far as the law goes. But then in Romans 7 he says, tell that commandment you shall not covet. Then I knew the game was up. Because he could, he could say I didn't commit adultery. And I don't have any idols. I don't have any other gods. And I keep the Sabbath very, very strictly. And I've not committed adultery or stolen. But covet, that's a matter of the heart. That one breaks me. Yeah, man. I was. I wanted to go back to the, your comment on the civil use there for a second, Terry. On, I mean, it's really not that long ago that there were all sorts of, of blasphemy laws, and every state had blue laws that violated that, that prohibited activity on Sunday. I mean, so so you're you're saying that we should like. I mean, obviously we don't live in any sort of a world where we could advocate for those things successfully now. But do you think that as Christians we should advocate, like we should desire that there would be some of those laws that <clears throat> are in the first table of the law? Yeah, I guess my bias is I think that that's the kind of thing that, come, that swells up from the bottom, not imposed from on the top. Um, so, you know, the obscenity laws and so forth, those were demanded. You know, in, um, in the 1920s and early 30s, uh, Hollywood was coming out with some borderline pornographic stuff. And, and uh, you know, the Catholic Church gave the order that Catholics were not to attend any of those movies. And the Protestants joined together and likewise denounced the movies. And so there was this groundswell, and that's when the Hays Code was enacted by Hollywood in self-defense, lest they go out of business. Mm -hmm. So it was, a, it was the people would not, um, they would not tolerate 
uh, the obscene in, in the Hollywood productions. So from the 1930s to the mid to late 1960s, you had pretty strict moral code governing what, what Hollywood is allowed to do. So whenever you know there was going to be a bedroom sin, they would walk through the door and then it would fade out. You know, as opposed to now, where you know we get every, from every angle. Um, so yes, I think that that, that in a, if if our society were more Christian, there would be Sabbath laws again. The stores would be closed. The commercial activity would cease. But I don't think you can impose that. I've not th thought that through like thoroughly theologically. I'm just saying I, I just don't think that we want to be in the business of imposing um, those standards. We want there to be a consensus and the people, you know, rising up and requiring it and demanding it and um, it being by conversion rather than by compulsion. And it's but it, it has been the case within the lifetime of some people here. Oh, I mean, no fault divorce laws. I mean, not that. Not all uh, that long ago. Ronald Reagan. Reagan. He was the first. 1970. Uh, adultery being criminalized. I think it's still on the books in many states. Though, birth, so. birth control was illegal. I think there's still a blue law in one of the Dakotas. In one state. Still. <clears throat> yeah. So, anyway. yeah. So, there was not. Uh, now all these things were illegal in this country. Uh, there was anti-sodomy laws in uh, many states. Um, so homosexual acts were, were prohibited by law. Um, so you know you start counting up what was consensus in Western civilization for a thousand years, you know honored in the breach, you know that uh, that definition or um, that description that hypocrisy is the price that vice pays to virtue. So hey, y'all gonna need to take that one in. Hypocrisy is the price that vice pays to virtue. Um, they have to pretend. Vice has to pretend virtue um, in, in, a, in, a, in a country in which certain standards of conduct are required. This restrains people. Yes. And uh, as opposed to opening Pandora's lock, a box and all hell breaking loose without, with no restraint. God, or in Romans 1 language, God giving a people over. Uh, to their passions. Larry? There seems to be sort of a counterintuitive experience to some extent with blue laws, things like that, uh, being in Massachusetts. The blue laws was, survived there longer than most of the country, yet it's the most secularized part of the country. And a son of mine was in Germany for a few years recently, and they still shut off the traffic lights on Sunday in the town he was wow. in. And the laws are very clear about being quiet and certain sort of a secularizing yet of the same civil uh, laws except uh, without the theology behind it. I don't understand that. Yeah. Yeah, it surprised me in England that the students at the University of Bristol didn't study. I was in Bristol at Trinity College and then there's the University of Bristol and it was just typical. They didn't study. They put down their books. To hmm? be fair, it's not hard to convince <laughs> that, that's fair. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it has only been 20 years ago, 2003, that sodomy laws were struck down as unconstitutional. Yeah. 20 years ago. And, and now it's a compulsory to recognize gay marriage. 12 years later, there's now a constitutional right for them to get married. Mm -hmm. All right, the bottom here, um, normative guide for believers. That's the so-called third use. It's the law of God as a rule of life for believers. So demonstrated graphically. Uh, so the law convicts of sin, driving us to Christ for salvation, who then sends us back to the law as a rule of life which then drives us to Christ for sanctification. So it continues. It has these roles. It has uh, the role in bringing us to Christ, and then it has this role in guiding us in living the Christian life. And throughout, we are depending upon Christ and the spirit of Christ to save us and to sanctify us. All right, question number Four, Ten Commandments are considered a summary of the moral law. Where are they found? 
two places. 20. Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. One difference between the two to notice is the Sabbath law is rooted in redemption in Deuteronomy 20 and in creation, or it's the other way around. I forget. One is in creation, one is in redemption. All right, uh, number five. In what sense are believers under the law, not under the law, but under grace? How does the moral law function in the life of the believer? Support your answer with scripture. Well, that's what I just attempted to, uh, to demonstrate. So as for being not under law, but under grace, sin will not have a dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. There's the phrase. What, then are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. That's not an invitation to sin. Well, again, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Absolutely, as an end for the attempt for us to uh, achieve a righteous status before God or to be justified on the basis of the law. No, it's the, it's the end. That's the word telos, which is an interesting use of that word, tel, uh, which means end or purpose. The objective of the law. The Christ, uh, for Christ is the objective of the law for, in other words, to drive us to Christ. Uh, the, the Christ is the telos, the, the law drives us to Christ. Or it's the, Christ is the end of the law as a means of righteousness. You can take it one of those two ways. You're not going to get to, to the righteous status. Uh, you're not going to achieve the righteousness that God requires of us on the basis of the law. So it's the end of the law as the means to be righteous, right in the sight of God for everyone that believes. Uh, I do not nullify the grace of God for if righteousness were through the law, this might be an excellent commentary on Romans 10.4, then Christ died for no purpose. If righteousness were through the law, if I could be right with God on the base of obedience and law keeping, why did Christ come? Why did Christ die? What would be the point of the incarnation? What would be the point of the atonement? We don't need a savior. We can save ourselves. We just need to be good. We just need to live righteously. If we could do that, then Christ died to no purpose. And yet, back to Romans 8, 4, the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk according to the flesh, but not according to the spirit. No, we're not under law for the sake of justification, but in order to please God, yes. You love me, you keep my commandments. Or, you know, Alec Motier, my Old Testament teacher in England and principal of Trinity College, he used to say, okay, you need to understand that in the, in the, in the New Testament, you have a polemic against the Pharisees who are seeking to be justified by law and in Jesus' ministry, and then a polemic against the Judaizers who are trying to add law, obedience to law, as an additional requirement necessary for justification. So you do have these very strong New Testament statements against the law, but it's in terms of the Pharisees and the Judaizers that's addressed to them and that problem in the first century among those who are seeking to introduce law as a means by which we enter into a right relationship with God. And he would say to us then, which I totally agree with, if you want to know the normative view of the law, um, you don't go here. You go here, oh, how I love your law. It's my meditation all the day. Repeat it again in, in uh, Psalm 119, verses 119, 163, 165, and then uh, Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2. The psalmist meditates on the law day and night. He loves the law. He doesn't see it as oppressive. He doesn't see it as, as his burden. Uh, his commandments are not burdensome. Is that 1 John 5? Uh, no, there's a love for it. These are beautiful laws, wonderful laws, helpful laws. Uh, so not under law as a means of justification, uh, but um, uh, under grace. Question six. Um, so what antinomian teachings continue to plague the church today? You can see the notes, and I'll put them up there in a second. Um, no obligation to keep God's law. You need to unhitch from the Old Testament. Who said that? Andy Stanley. Andy Stanley said 
we need to unhitch from the Old Testament. Unhitch Christianity from the Old Testament. And two weeks ago, he held a gay affirming conference at his church. Right. Mm -hmm. That shows how unhitched he is from the Old Testament. <laughs> <laughs> and the New Testament. <laughs> I mean, there's just a confusion. I mean, I, it, it goes along the lines of the dispensational, uh, the dispensationalism we talked about before. Just total confusion about how these things integrate. Lack of distinctions. I mean, lack of distinctions between like justification, sanctification. I think those things really like hurt your ability to read the New Testament right and understand when it's talking about law and works. We're talking about it in one context and not in another. There's just confusion. So you have just beautifully described why we study theology. So Packer, Dr. Packer would, would uh, compare, would, would use the analogy of an upward spiral of Bible study and theological study. Bible study informs your theology, your theology informs your Bible study, which informs your theology, which informs your Bible study. And there's an upward spiral of comprehension. Yeah, you run into these words like good works. Like you're saying, what? Where does that fit? Well, if you're just opening the Bible and reading it, you don't know where it fits. So you have to have an understanding of you know, justification and how works relate to justification and grace um, and good deeds. Um, and, and it's through, through Bible study and then theological study and creating the categories and understanding where things fit that you, you're able to read the Bible more accurately. All right, so uh, any, any other just examples of where you see antinomianism? Yes. The, the question I hear often is, but is it helpful? As, you know, as if the, the, um, we can take, remove ourselves from what God's word says, discern for ourselves and judge for ourselves if it's, <laughs> the outcome is good, and then on the basis of that, fall into law. As though that were the ultimate criteria. Is it helpful versus unhelpful. Right. And, and we get to get judge God's word yeah. to decide what well, ultimately, ultimately, yeah, yeah, you're ultimately putting yourself in the place of God when you when you do that. Yeah. Mm. So, so then, then you could also speak. claim that you're yeah. just listening to how the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, yeah. and that is what's guiding you more. Right. Than so, it, and it's kind of a trump card question. It's a little bit like, well, God told me, sort of, so to speak. Yeah. Well, there's no answer to that one. Yeah. How do you? Oh, Right. If God, if God told you, well, you know, how do you argue with that? Don't you want the little children to be helped? And don't you want this thing over here? <laughs> right. So I, I've, I think that there, have, there frequently are appeals to love as opposed to law. There's appeals to the spirit as opposed to the law or even the word. Um, and when you unhitch love and spirit from law, word, you are at sea. You're, there's no telling where you'll go, and you can go most anywhere. Uh, when you, when you uh, de detach the work of the Spirit or detach love from the categories of right and wrong found in the law of God, then you, you just end up falling back on, here's what I feel. Here's what I want. And God wants what I want because he's good. I mean, you do hear this reasoning, right? God must want what I want because he wants me to be happy because he's good. And all of this is just, uh, it's just, it's detached from the moral categories that we find in the Bible. Yeah, man. I mean, the, where it's first John that says God is love, and first John is also where it says God is light. Because they're opposite, there's, there's, there's tension between those two concepts. Light drives out darkness, and people don't consider those two connected. On the, when you're reading Psalm 119, Psalm 19, Psalm 1, I feel like the, 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 the most common response you would hear from Christians out there is, well, what does it say in the New Testament? I just think that is so powerful in people's thinking. If it says it in the Old Testament, it's not vouched for in the New Testament. It just doesn't carry a lot of weight. Or, or is it in the red letters? Or is it in the red letters? Right. That, I mean, it destroys people's theology. The red letters, it's very confusing to people. Yeah, apparently one of the children in the Sunday school this past week, um, uh, the teacher was asking, where do we learn what God says to us? And the answer was supposed to be the Bible. And one of the kids raised her hand, uh, raised her, her hand, and said, "In the red letters." If you want, if you want the, the the book with the most red letters, it's Leviticus. The entire book is quotes of God speaking to Moses. Is that right? It is. That's hilarious. All right, here's some here's some examples of antinomianism. And let me preface it by saying, even in the PCA, there was a 
very serious and destabilizing outbreak of antinomianism around 2010, 11, 12, 13. Um, and uh, it got to the point where even uh, preachers like Harry Reeder, who's like, you know, just barely escapes the Baptist fundamentalist m method of preaching and evangelism. You know, he's just, he's just this, it's what he was. And he's, he, he's a gospel preacher, bless his memory. Even he was accused of being a legalist uh, because he would say that there are things that we ought to do. There were people that in the PCA were saying, you, you, uh, don't ought me. Don't ought me. Don't, uh, don't, don't, don't uh, t tell us what we have to do or must do. There was a r real rebellion. So here are some of, some of the uh, ways in which I, I would say antinomianism rears its ugly head today. The denial of the normativity of the moral law, its third use as a rule of life for the believer. These are, these are all in your notes, by the way. Denial that God sees sin in believers because he only sees them clothed with Christ's righteousness. This leads to the denial that God is ever displeased with believers or ever judges them or even disciplines them. Three, denial of the necessary connection between obedience and God's blessing. Four, the denial of the necessary connection between justification and sanctification. Five, the denial of the necessity of effort in sanctification. Six, the denial of the necessity of repentance for salvation. Seven, the denial of good works as necessary as a sign of grace, though not meritorious. Eight, the denial of multiple motivations for believers' obedience, example, duty, fear, hatred of evil, promise of reward, etc. Limiting Christian motivation to gratitude for one's justification. Very Lutheran point of view that was being um, widely disseminated. Uh, nine, the denial of the grace of law. Ten, the denial of continuity between Old and New Testaments, interpreting the Old Testament as an era of salvation by law keeping and good works, and the New Testament as an era of salvation by faith and grace. So then, like you said, it's sensationalism. We may have been defeated in like the academy, but I think it permeates. <coughs> oh, absolutely. <coughs> Oh, I was glad to hear you say that because I've been saying this for a while. It's good to hear it from someone else. It's not just me. Right. Hey, Aaron. Uh, you go first. I, gotta, I was just going to say, I think it was number six there in that list. I mentioned briefly, that made me think of the Mara controversy. Um, must one turn from sin in order to come to God? Uh, and that was the, the big debate there. The necessity of repentance for salvation. Would we say that that's necessary prior to as a condition of salvation? Or no, I mean we def we define repentance as as an aspect of faith, necessarily turning from sin, sin to God. It's all a unit a, 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 a unitive action. He's to save me from my sin, not with my sin. I'm turning from yeah, sin to God. You know, when does each thing happen and really lots of things happen at one time? Yes. Uh, you know, the, and the marrow, you know, Thomas Boston even admitted later that, uh, that the marrow, there were some um, unfortunately obscure expressions. Even among the marrow, the marrow men were fighting for the freeness of grace when Church of Scotland had itself deteriorated into a in some circles, in, into some legalism. But there were good men on both sides of that controversy. <coughs> um, Ron Parrish um, rewrote, retranscribed uh, the communion um, catechism. Um, that was uh, written by the author Escapes My Name. My, he was on the other side of the Merrill controversy. He was a good, solid, godly man. So, so there, there yeah, I don't want to be on the wrong side of the Merrill controversy for sure, but it's not as cut and dry as sometimes people have made it seem. Yes? I just, I, it's in one of my older notebooks, but I had the opportunity to sit in on a Dallas Seminary class um, a few years ago, and I, I recall sitting in the class and the professor was going through uh, some of God's law, and it was a very um, abbreviated survey. Uh, but I recall distinctly, and I wanted to quote it exactly, but I'll get as close as I can. And it was a recounting of a portion of his law, followed by the professor's exclamation of how he hates this scripture. 
Hey, Yikes. Hmm. this was their, this was their, one of their primary systematic theology professors teaching systematic theology today. At well, I just finished reading the rise and fall of dispensationalism. Is that all tied up in the whole dispensational idea? It is, and one of one of their um, one of their primary principles uh, was this Old Testament New Testament distinction, and they defined faith as assent. They really had reduced it to that. And Zane Ho Zane Hodges and Charles Ryrie and Lewis Berry Schaefer, who is the the systematician of dispensationalism at Dallas Seminary, and then Hodges and 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 Ryrie. The Ryrie Study Bible, if you're familiar with that, uh, just uh, loaded with dispensational distinctions. Old Testament law, New Testament grace. Old Testament works, New Testament faith. Um, Old Testament Israel, New Testament the church. Two distinct peoples of God. Um, yeah, but most of that has disappeared. The, the title of the book, <laughs> The Rise and Fall, that that uh, strict classic dispensationalism has collapsed. It's not in the seminaries anymore. There's, been, there's now a cause, what they're calling a progressive uh, dispensationalism, of which a, a number of their, their men and Vern Poitras has said there isn't a hair's breadth between progressive dispensationalism and covenant theology. They basically have conceded all the points. And the, as a system, the whole thing in the academic, now in popular, out there in the popular world, the Left Behind series, you know, and how Lindsay before that, so that the popular presentations that have no academic credibility are as popular as ever. But the academic or scholastic dispensationalism with those kinds of distinctions and categories has collapsed. It's not at Grace Seminary, it's not at Talbot, it's not at Western Seminary, it's not at Dallas. They're all, they've all abandoned the categories. This, you mentioned Vern. Uh, is, is he uh, progressive? Who? No, no, he, he went, he had a meeting back in, I think, 1999 with the younger theologians. See, the, the classic dispensationalism was not able to reproduce itself. All their younger theologians were coming up covenantal. And, you know, there was a, you know, a tension out at the seminary, and they invited Vern Poitras to come out there for discussions. He's New Testament at Westminster in Philadelphia. And, you know, they saw again and again how close they were to each other on issue after issue. So it's, it's, it's interesting. They, they, are, they are strongly moving in a covenantal direction. All right, we need to make a little more progress here. Define legalism. What is it? What is it not? See paragraphs one through three. Uh, the liberty which Christ hath purchased for believers under the gospel consists in their freedom from the guilt of sin, the condemning wrath of God, the curse of the moral law, and in their being delivered from this present evil world bondage to Satan and dominion of sin, from the evil of afflictions, the sting of death, the victory of the grave, and everlasting damnation. So also in their free, so this is freedom for, this would be the for side, that's the from side the, up to that point, uh, free access to God and their yielding obedience unto him, not out of slavish fear, servile fear, but a childlike filial fear and childlike love and a willing mind, all which were common also to believers under the law, but under the New Testament, the liberty of the Christian is further enlarged in their freedom from the yoke of the ceremonial law, by which is meant, just think what it took to keep the sacrificial system going. Um, Paul Johnson, whose book uh, Modern Times is, is many, many, uh, of our people will have read that book. It is a fantastic book. But he also wrote a book called The History of Christianity in which he has several paragraphs where he talks about what it took to keep the sacrificial system going. Very, very illuminating. The whole process of thousands and thousands of animals being slaughtered um, and the blood and the carcasses and the whole routine, the burden of keeping that going year after year, decade after century. So that that's... Uh, Freedom from the yoke of the ceremonial law, keeping that whole uh, sacri the whole apparatus of sacrifice going century after century. We're free from that, in which the Jewish church was subjected and in greater boldness of access to the throne of grace. We don't, we don't access that through a priesthood as uh, New Testament believers. 
And in fuller communications of the free spirit, the spirit was given periodically and selectively, like the spirit might come uh, upon Samson um, or Elijah, but not, uh, not universally, whereas in the New Testament, universally given. And believers under the, uh, uh, then believers uh, under the law did ordinarily partake. God alone is Lord of the conscience and hath left it free from the doctrines and commandments of men which are in anything contrary to the word or beside it. Remember again, the, 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 the context of the confession is you know, the battle that's going on with the Church of England. And this beside it, we'll get to that, but it, beside it is, has, has, has everything to do with the imposition of a written liturgy on the church that God has not ordained and God has not commanded and dem demanding absolute conformity to it, uniform application of it without deviation. So that, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's uh, certainly part of what that is referring to. If matters of faith or worship. So that to believe such doctrines or to obey such commands, so monastic vows. These are things that, that are uh, beside. Does God require a vow of poverty? Does he require a vow of mm -hmm. celibacy so that you never marry? Does he require a vow of obedience to uh, monastic authorities? Uh, no. Or to obey such commands out of conscience or is to betray true liberty of conscience and the requiring of an implicit faith and an absolute and blind obedience is to destroy liberty of conscience and reason also. Um, yeah, Rome has this category, the Praetor Scripturum, pious advice it was called, endorsed by uh, Aquinas and others uh, that the church was believed to have the power to impose. So fasting on Friday, for example. Can, can the church require of all Catholics to go to oracle confession, go to the priest and confess? Can it require fasting on every Friday? Can it and, and, uh, uh, require observance of Ash Wednesday um, and other holy days? These are things that are beyond scripture. The church does not have authority to create holy days and ceremonies and rituals and make them obligatory for God's people. Um, they who upon pretense of Christian liberty do practice any sin or cherish any lust do thereby destroy the end of Christian liberty which is that being delivered out of the hands of our enemies we may serve God without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives. So there's the problem of the, the Antinobians or the Libertines who abuse freedom, use freedom as a license for sin. Um, and then uh, par paragraph four has to do with um, uh, the civil government, which we'll come back to. So here's how I would answer question number, I'm getting my numbers confused. Seven. Number seven. This is number seven. All right, question number seven. Here are the four ways in which um, we can identify legalism. So, so the confession is basically talking about create freedom from freedom for. So we are free to obey, to serve uh, God. Uh, and we are free from uh, seeking to be justified by good works. So here are the ways in which we can just, uh, define legalism. And I think it's important to do so because the accusation of legalism is tossed about promiscuously and irresponsibly today. So that anybody that says that there's anything that you ought to do and should do and are required to do as a Christian, they're accused of being a legalist. Mm -hmm. Comes up especially in connection with the Sabbath um, today. But anyway, here, here's, here's I think properly defined, here's what uh, legalism is. Seeking to be justified by works. You are severed from Christ who would be justified by the law, Galatians 5.4. Two, following the letter but not the spirit of the law. Again, all this is in your printed notes. Um, this, is, this is the most obvious and tragic, is justification by works. That's a legalistic system. 
But then, following the letter, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. This is the typical criticism of the Old Testament prophets uh, uh, that is repeated over and over again. External conformity, internally um, idolatrous uh, and self-indulgent. They are whitewashed tombs, Jesus said. They're clean on the outside. They look good. The appearance is right, but inside, corruption. Okay, third, binding the conscience through man-made rules. So Jesus said to the Pharisees, they tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. Paul refers to those who say, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Extra biblical requirements. You observe days and months and seasons and years. There's the imposition of the, the you might say, here's the imposition of the dietary laws. Here's the imposition of a calendar of holy days. So here's what I was referring to, Rome's pra Praetor Scripturum, pious advice to, to, besides scripture that can be imposed on the church and on Christians as obligatory. And then a, a fourth uh, a way in which we can be holistic is secondary issues at the expense of primaries, straining gnats and swallowing camels. So what, what it is, is um, what it is not, legalism is not striving for precise, exact obedience. So Jesus says, your right eye offends, you pluck it out. Your right hand offends, you cut it off. So that's pretty strict um, requirements for obedience. That's, that's, that's obedience being taken extremely serious, right? You cut off your hand if it's going to make you sin. Of course, that's hyperbole, but you get the point. And here, Jesus condemns the Pharisees. You mint dill, you, you tied mint, dill, and cumin, but you've neglected the weightier matters of the law. That's uh, this problem. Justice, uh, mercy, and faithfulness. These you ought to have done. In other words, the, the tithing of the mint, dill, and cumin, that was a good thing. Precise obedience was good, down to the spices. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. But you know, in other words, not expense of the weightier matters of justice, and uh, mercy and faithfulness. That's when the uh, is that when the Pharisees were saying if you if you would give in this particular way, then you could neglect your uh, neglect having to support your parents and stuff like that. Well, that's part of the criticism. Yes. Yes, that, that's in Matthew 15, uh, right, where they were using you know their they were using. There, they're using extra biblical requirements to invalidate required, uh, required commandments. All right, so, uh, so yeah, we need to be careful about, about what we understand about legalism. Uh, we, we don't want to be a legalist, but we need to understand what legalism is. Uh, it's not a zeal to obey and uh, to pursue holiness. All right, we are out of time. And... Uh, we're going to have a lot to cover next Tuesday and Wednesday. So hopefully you can get ahead of the game.